I think we're standing on a genuine precipice. And it's getting worse all the time because of this misunderstanding, misinterpretation of our societies. And what I mind is that this is the best chance we have. You know, there isn't another option. We don't have, for instance, if we're going to go back to this line of racial segregation, this time enforced by so-called anti-racists, we go back to hell, absolute hell. And you can feel it daily. What's eroding is the settlement that we had on that. You know, Sam Harris and I have said before, you know, we had hoped to arrive at a stage where skin color was as unimportant as hair color. And now these people come along. It's like having a ginger separatist movement. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, to, to decide we should only speak about hair color for the rest of our lives then creates countervailing forces and much more. But it's like the settlements that we were hoping to head towards are being pulled apart by people who seem gleeful at pulling away the threads of our society. They seem positively gleeful about it. And that goes back to your, your point about reason. That's because there is an instinct that drives people to destroy. You know, it's, it's there throughout human nature. The instinct to destroy is very strong. The high octane of enjoyment of destruction. Isn't it also because it's easy, Douglas? It's far easier to destroy than it is to create. That's right. That's one of the central Burkean insights. Um, yes. It, you you can pull pull a thing down in a, in a second, and it takes a long time to build it up. You you can destroy a building or a statue in no time at all. It might take somebody an entire lifetime to create it. And so we find ourselves in a very suboptimal condition because the desire to pull down is clearly rife. But maybe this is an evidence that people have to endlessly relearn the same lessons. You know, there's a line in Eliot in *Murder in the Cathedral*. He says, "Men do not very, men do not learn very much, um, except that from generation to generation the same things happen again and again." Men learn little from others' experience. You're sounding very apocalyptic, Douglas. Uh, and I don't blame you because I don't disagree with you. And the question that Francis and I really both wanted to ask is, do you think we are past the point of no return now? No, I don't. I'll tell you why. These are the circumstances outside. But the circumstances outside are always bad. <laughs> They're always bad. Now, there's particular peaks to the mania. I've been reading quite a lot about revolutions recently for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just so striking, the extent to which this is just, it's just what happened in 1789. It's just what happened in 1917. I was reading the other day an account of in the days after the revolution in 1917 in St. Petersburg, when, you know, law and order, of course, is all fallen apart, but people are sort of starting to police themselves and sort of quasi, no one quite knows, because, of course, the revolution was meant to bring the peace, but no one actually focused on any of the details, just like in 1789. So nobody knows what to do when things go wrong, like crime. And there's a description, an incredibly haunting description I read of uh, on a tram in St. Petersburg in 1917, a, a, a rather well-dressed woman, uh, and there's a rather well-dressed man standing near, standing near her, and he, um, she starts screaming. Uh, she thinks he's stolen her purse, and everyone gets interested, and they start finding out what's happened. The man insists he hasn't stolen her purse, and uh, a couple of men who are the sort of self-appointed police at this point decide that he, he must have done clearly, and they take him off the tram and shoot him in the head. And they get back on the tram, and the woman finds that the purse has fallen down the lining of her coat. And then they have a problem, of course. So they take her off the tram and shoot her in the head as well. <laughs> it's a Russian way, mate. What can I say? That's how it's we effective. do things. You know, and that's what happens in revolutions. That's what happens when everything starts to break down. That's what's happened in Kenosha briefly. 
That's what happens when, you know, one person thinks he's going to go and protect a shop and then gets peers, one particular case that I'm thinking about, obviously, appears to have been separated from other people and then the people who are the protesters and recognize who he is. And then before you know it, he ends up shooting three people dead. You know, that's what happens. What's happening in Portland? People being dragged out of their cars and smashed in the head or shot. That's what happens when everything else breaks down. But so we might be in one of these periods and it might get a lot worse yet. Or it could get better. But the reason for optimism on it, as it were, is that this is what history is always like. And we've had a very blessed time in our lives so far. And I don't need to tell you to. All of us here know something a lot of people outside this room don't, which is that we're the luckiest damn people in history. And luckier than any of our forebears, and luckier than we have any right to expect. But it was always like this in history. And the thing that's most important, the thing in a way I think is most important for us all to be thinking about and the people watching, particularly young people watching, to be thinking about is this. It's always like this to some extent and don't wait for more optimal conditions before you do what you're meant to be doing in your life because the optimal conditions will not be arriving. And it's a great point you make. And do you think part of the reason we've come to this point is because of cowardice. And I use that word in its truest sense of a lot of the mainstream media, in particular, the left, the center left, who seem unwilling to stand up and say to these people, you may be on on our side, you may be on our side politically, but what you are doing is fundamentally wrong and destructive. Yes, uh, and they, or they want power more than they want truth. But sorry to interrupt, Douglas. I mean, I don't think you can lay the blame for that only with the left. I mean, look at Boris Johnson on on BLM. He he did very little, said almost nothing. Yeah. To 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 his to tackle it. There are two excuses for that, which I don't like at all. One is that he was still ill. Yeah. Possibly, but in that case, somebody else from the government had to make a stand. The second is that some people say this is a typical Boris Johnson tactic, that his desire tends to be to wait till there's massive overreach by his opponents and then say something. If it's not overreach when the cenotaph is being attacked, I don't know what is, mm. you know, or when the Winston Churchill statue is being attacked. But your point still stands, which is cowardice. Yeah, cowardice, is that, yes. Is that cowardice, it? Cowardice, a desire for a quiet life. Um, but as I say, also prioritizing the search for power over truth. Mm. You know, the, the New York Times, which is just a lost publication now, clearly, um, you know, has, has deliberately inverted the nature of these riots. You know, as pro-Trump supporters become more violent, protesters have to work out how they should react, was one of the <laughs> headlines, something like that, one of the headlines they did the other day, as if the sort of black bloc protesters are just sitting around a rather... A contemplative body, these uh, these uh, protesters. Uh, so yes, th- those people want to be in power more than they seek truth, which is a calculation that will come back and bite them at some point. I mean, hope it bites them fast, but probably not. Um, but to come back to this point, it's it's really crucial, I think, that we start to bear this in mind. We've spoken before about the overemphasis of politics in all of our lives, the, the way in which it's become almost a full-time occupation for too many people, you know. Um, and, I mean, I, I think that when politics is as, gets as bad as particularly in America it now is, uh, people start to wonder what they can do. And other than voting, there's not very much that most people can do um, other than influencing the people around them. What I'm worried about is this endless opportunity cost. You know, Pluckrose and Lindsay say in their book at one point, what would have happened if the academics doing all this complete wank about, you know, intersectionalism and, you know, comparative feminist theory and the intersections with disability and fat studies, what if they'd have done something meaningful with their time? What if they'd studied something that was of importance? What if 
all of that brain power, and it must by now be a considerable amount of brain power, had been expended on a worthwhile problem. Well, maybe we'd be a bit, bit further forward. What have those people brought us? I thought nothing. But now it turns out it's worse than nothing. It's an actually malevolent, malignant thing that they have been injecting into the thought of our society. So again, just to come back to this point, what do we do as individuals about this? We all have a limited amount we can do in our personal lives in terms of trying to correct untruths, correct false narratives. But other than that, I think it's a very important message that we remember you, you shouldn't put off what it is you should be doing with your life, nevertheless. <laughs>